All right, everybody, welcome back to The Grit Show. I'm here with my homeboy, my man, my brother, Tyrell Gray. How are we? Oh, man, killing it. Dude, it's been a while. It has, I know. Like, you've been on the whirlwind tour. Uh, I've been to Greenland. Dude, like, that was a first. Dude, you sent me some pictures of the Northern Lights. And oh, some man. Massive, that like, ice, ice walls and some giant animals that you tracked down. And Dude, there's a reason the Vikings were so gritty. Dude. Like, you got to have some grit to live in that place. A couple years ago, I went to Iceland, and it was amazing. And so Greenland is definitely on my list. Oh, you'd love but it. But I think they're named up. Back, so they're, I, I they're named, just, yeah, what, what heard the that? story yeah. when I was there. So uh, the story was the king of Denmark was kind of claiming these two islands. Iceland is actually really green. Greenland's really icy. Yes, and yep. so they named them the opposite because the king got to choose which island he wanted first. So he's like, well, dude, I don't want Iceland. That sounds terrible. So he chose Greenland when it was really 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 shitty <laughs> actually i shouldn't say that because i actually loved it like it was an amazing place it was yeah, super the, cool the, uh, the pictures you sent were, were spectacular so all right well we're back here for another episode we're, we're so thrilled with the feedback we've been getting we uh we love to hear that you guys are enjoying it you're gaining value from it that you're sharing it um and so you we're just super stoked and excited about that so we've got a, we've got a really cool guest today um on instagram he's ben no coach bunny yeah, coach, un- coach underscore bunny. That's coach my uh, that's bunny. my Instagram. Yeah, why 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 coach bunny? We'll just start right there. This is Ben, by the way. Yeah, bunny. Why coach bunny? Well, this is perfect. This is perfect that you've asked this question in this way because it's it's going to lead me right into my old elevator pitch, right? So uh, <laughs> good, I can't wait. I had uh, I had spent the better part of twenty years in the military. Um, spent the majority of my time in the military as a Green Beret before transitioning. Um, into a, a role as an infantry officer, and that's kind of how I how I finished out my career. Um, and uh, as I was uh, finishing my career in the military, I, I started my own business. I started a, a CrossFit gym in Tampa, Florida. Real original, um, you know, a special forces guy or an army guy or gal getting out and starting a CrossFit gym. But I was super passionate about it. I found CrossFit. Um, I was an early adopter. Started doing it in 2005 when it was still managed on a WordPress site. Okay. And uh, went to my first level one certification in 2008 um, in my hometown of Tampa, Florida, and was kind of coach groups and individuals off and on since that time. And um, even though, you know, I, you know, continued to do, you know, various jobs and, and hold various roles in the military, um, you know, CrossFit was a very, very common through line for me. You know, every time I went to a new city or place or found myself, you know, Ford deployed in, uh, in various places in Southwest Asia. You know, I'd always go and look for the CrossFit gym and, and the other CrossFit people. And, uh, you know, once I opened up my own gym in Tampa, Florida, around the same time, I also like found Instagram, like around 2014, 2015, opened opened my gym respectively in 2016. But I, I chose Coach Bunny because like that was essentially, you know, my uh, uh, my personality or that was like my my thing outside of the military and at the time it was not it was not considered popular to talk too much about the military profession on the internet and i know a lot of people build their entire personalities or their entire profiles yeah. or their entire existence is, is sometimes their profession like sometimes their job is just like yo i, I had a, a cool military experience i just like travel around the united states and talk about it uh, <laughs> but at that particular point in time it was not it was not uh it was not really it was sort of frowned upon so uh so i chose coach bunny and it's it's sort of stuck and incidentally like i've i've continued to maintain roles uh as a coach in some way shape or form so you know about four and a half years ago i got i'm just imagining that coach bunny didn't necessarily strike fear into the heart of the enemy as a green beret I suppose not, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, around the time, I mean, around the time I uh, I, I had an Instagram, you know, I, I guess the big war was sort of over, right? Like it was, yeah. it was 2014, 2015. My my last deployment was in Afghanistan in 2013, um, and you know, had its ups and downs and stuff like that. But like after, even then, you know, things were kind of winding down. So, uh, you know, I, I decided to pick a, a bit of a, a softer moniker for for Instagram, for the social media. It's, and it's okay. You know, I got like, you know, 17,000 people that intermittently pay attention to what I'm doing. Sometimes like what I do, sometimes dislike what I do. You know how that is. You can't, can't make everybody happy. I found that typically speaking, the, the, the loudest boos are coming from the cheapest seats, but that's okay. You know, I'm, 
I'm happy. I'm just happy people are paying attention. For those of you that don't know Ben, I've, I've got a chance to know Ben fairly well through some nonprofit work that we do together. And he is the epitome of a man. So go look at his Instagram. He's an absolute beast. Matter of fact, this is the guy when Chuck Norris wakes up in the morning, he's like, I want to be like Ben. Like, let me be like Ben today. <laughs> hey, funny, funny story. I have a, I have a portrait style tattoo of Chuck Norris on my left arm. <laughs> I almost, I almost have to see this. <laughs> I know. I know. Do you need me to take my shirt off and show you? I think I do. I okay. think it's only appropriate. I'm, I'm, I'm here for it. Thank, thank, thank God at the, at the wise old age of 40, I still have decent body composition, but Right there on the inside arm is, is oh Chuck. hell yeah! Wow, if you're listening yeah. to this audio, you've got to tune into the YouTube channel. Yeah, right? and if you see, there's this is a little bomber plane dropping bombs. That wasn't my idea. The the tattoo artist, as he was in the 25th hour of of uh, kind of putting together a Chuck Norris tattoo, asked me if it was okay if he could put a bomber plane in there, and I was like, no problem whatsoever. Feel free. <laughs> he, was like, was, he was like, I was thinking I'd like to put in a tank or something like that, and I was like. <laughs> And I was like, well, tank, bomber. And I was like, really, man, it's up to you. Whenever I have a rule about tattoos, when the tattoo artist feels inspired about something, you should let him do it because it's probably going to pan out for you. You know what I mean? Yeah, I like it. I try not to be too particular when I'm getting my tattoos. And I've, I've lost a couple bets and I've got a couple bad ones in some bad places. But that's okay. It happens, <laughs> we're, you know? we're not going to show those ones today. You don't want to see it. You don't want to see we're it. This is a family show. We're just going to stick with the Chuck Norris ones because he's a, he's a total badass. And, and yeah, yeah, super fair. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and yeah, yeah, you look great for 40. Yeah. Uh, CrossFit I, I, seems to be working. Yeah, well, it's it's not just CrossFit. I do, um, you know, I'm, I'm involved in a lot of different athletic pursuits. I'm kind of a, a serial, uh, like I collect athletic hobbies. You know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm bad about it. Uh, most recently, I'm, I'm going to try and, and run uh, 40, 41 miles on my 41st birthday. Okay. So I've been running about uh, three or four times a week, you know, trying to make sure that I, I, I get enough volume before that happens so I don't break my feet. I've I've previously participated in, in a few ultras, didn't train for them at all, just like went out and ran 30 Ks or 50 Ks. And it would like take me an egregious amount of time. And I usually like broke a foot or both of them. So this kind of stuff. So okay, I'm I trying wanna... to avoid that at this old age. Because yeah. I think now I'll actually end up in the hospital. Yeah, I want to chime in real quick for, for the listeners that are, that are that are paying attention. Uh, and this is this is a huge thing because people get motivated, inspired and fired up. And then all of a sudden they just walk out their front door and tackle a 50K in the mountains. And I'm like, guys, listen this is not something you do like oh. your, your results and how you feel are always going to be a direct reflection of your preparation that's right and, and so i just you know you can you can want to do these badass things and whatnot but just take a little bit of time to what like the impact that it's going to have on you and it may not be the smartest thing look maybe start with a 5k don't get yeah. off the couch and go jump into the mountains and i get you want to show that you're a bad man or a bad woman um, but let's just take it one step at a time because the last thing you want to do is 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 create a lifelong chronic injury because you wanted to potentially play a man card. Yeah, so, and I, I tell people uh, the converse to that is a lot of times people will will see like really incredible athletic feats, you know, like at like as a for instance, like like you know, doing 50 Ironmans, to, you know, in 50 days across 50 states or shit like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, right. <laughs> That kind of stuff, uh, you know, uh, but, uh, you know, and, and they see that and they're like, I'll never be able to do a half try because I can't do that. What I just saw. And I'm like, yo, man, just because you're watching somebody run uh, 26 miles at the Olympics does not mean you can't go do a couple laps around your block. And I encourage people and I work in the health and wellness industry. I work in the fitness industry. I own a gym and I tell people all the time. I'm like, listen, man, like, you know, the, the hardest thing that you're going to do in terms of getting started on any athletic journey is just like walking through the door. You know, I recently started, I picked up jujitsu as an additional athletic hobby. And a lot of people talk, there's a lot of talk about which belt is the best or which belt you learn the most at, or which belt is the most important. And like, from my perspective, the most important belt that you can, or the most transition period or the, the most important part um, in terms of like going from one belt to the other is going from just a regular belt that you're wearing with pants to a white belt, meaning walking through the front door and, com and committing, committing yourself to a new sport, particularly one where you will be made to feel inadequate, in some cases made to be humiliated. In some cases, if it's a combat sport or if it's an endurance sport, you will, you 
it's not a matter of if you're going to be hurt, you will be hurt doing those type of sports. If you get involved in an endurance athletics, if you're an endurance athlete, truly if you're running ultras and this kind of stuff, you will get hurt. If you're doing combat sports, another man or another woman will hurt you at some point. Like you will require medical attention. That's what you're signing up for. Um, so when, when somebody makes a decision to get, dedicate time and effort towards something that they know is potentially going to gonna land them at the hospital there. It's almost certain that they'll need medical attention at some point. I have a lot of respect for that. You know, I have a lot of respect for that. And I'm also like, man, what is the matter with you? <laughs> kind of crazy. Now, now, I, now, ben, if I can interject, like I, I truly respect you to the ultimate level, your career, what you've done, who you are as an individual, like ultimate respect for you, consider you a friend. And and our belief, and I, and I think you'd agree with me, is doing hard stuff like that helps you develop that grit. Like there's some people that aren't just born with it. Now, is that something you've always, have you always been like this or have you gradually, because you've gone through some really hard crap in the military. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I've, I've had some, some some pretty terrible times in the military. And you know what, this is what I'll share with you. When I, so when I, I'll tell you about it when I joined the military. So when I joined the military, I mean, first and foremost, I was 17 years old. Um, at the time, I was in a lot of trouble in school. I was in a lot of trouble in school. Nothing crazy. It wasn't. I wasn't involved in like violent crime um, or drugs or anything like this. But um, you know, I was just kind of into criminal mischief. I'd gotten involved in a couple of high school pranks, but it cost the city quite a bit of money. And I was indeed. They had put a DA on us. I had actual detectives like you know were getting warrants, searching my friends' houses, finding receipts for like concrete and other weird that we had bought. You know, to like facilitate pranks. Like we like cemented the gate shut to the school you know <laughs> like they had these golf carts they would drive around uh, campus in and we dug huge holes and buried the golf carts in them and you know just goofy stuff but we ended up causing quite a bit of damage unknown unbeknownst to us we were causing some, some significant damage these other two kids you know they uh they had parents that were well to do one kid is his dad was a one-star general another guy his his father um, had been retired law enforcement or something to this effect and had worked in adjacent county as a municipal servant but was making great money and like my parents were high school teachers you know what I'm saying I was poor and you know I had gotten in trouble and essentially had like joined the military as, as a way to opt out of it I, I, I tell my mom this or I, I tell the story all the time it was like go I had to join the army or go to jail it wasn't quite that simple like but the mechanism was essentially the same um, I had no way out of my hometown. I had no qualifying factors whatsoever that were going to give me a position in a uh, university, whether it was community college or otherwise, like I had done nothing to set myself up for success. So the only way for me to kind of find a way out was, was to join the military. I did so at 17, my first PT test, the first, you know, physical fitness exam that they give you when you're in the military is they give you a one mile for time, max effort, uh, push-ups in one minute, max effort sit-ups in one minute and it's about half of what you're actually expected to do once you're in basic training in order to graduate you obviously have to get a requisite score in all in all those kind of uh categories or areas my um my one mile took almost almost nine minutes i almost didn't pass it in the requisite amount of time i did i think uh something like 18 push-ups and like 26 sit-ups like and I almost threw up. Like I like I almost passed out. Right, eighteen uh, push-ups so, in a minute. Yeah, in a minute. That's like all I had. And I'm talking about I was shaking like I had been hurt with it, like hit with nerve agent. Like I mean I was messed up. Now like fast forward like four or five years. Um, and at this point I had deployed into the initial invasion to Iraq, and I was I was about some different at that point in my life. But like I maxed out every category without exception on the PT test, like just crushed it all. Like I could like wake up, eat a bowl of spaghetti and drink a beer and go destroy the PT test. But I had <laughs> no athletic background. I had nothing that lent towards me having the ability to perform well physically. I had to develop that on my own once I joined the military, because once I got into the military, I realized that there was this expe expectation for physical performance and after I had been involved in the military for a while, after I witnessed September 11th happen, after I participated in the initial invasion to Iraq, this kind of stuff, I, I, I knew that I wanted to seek out increased roles of responsibility. I wanted to be involved 
in a way that was more significant than what I currently was doing. And it just, it required increased physical performance. So it's like, I kind of started this journey where I was like, okay, like I'm going to, I'm going to learn to perform well physically. And that's kind of how I got into athletics. And at first it was born out of necessity, but after a while, it just became like my hobby and my passion. So do you think, it, do you think it's fair to say that the military kind of forged and formed the, the person you are today? I, 100%, right? Um, you know, I, I was a pretty soft kid. I, I, I was impolite. I didn't respect authority. Um, I didn't, I didn't value the things that had been given to me by my parents. I certainly didn't recognize how difficult it had been for, for my mother. You know, I was, I was raised primarily by my mother. She's my hero. Didn't realize the kind of sacrifices that she had made initially, at least to get, to get me to where I was at that point. Um, and, uh, I think, you know, having spent time in the military where, where, you know, you're made to make some pretty significant sacrifices, uh, both personally and professionally. Um, gave me like added perspective. I, I think really kind of like helped to kind of turn me into the man that I am today. It was a good, it was a formative experience. Like the military is a is a great way to to groom young men and women into being formidable adults later on in life. For the most part, you know, I, I know not everybody has the same experience, but at least that's what it was for me, at least. So real quick. So if you like, let's say someone, a young man or young woman is struggling and they stumble upon our podcast today. Um, or wherever they are in the, in their journey, um, would you say something like combat sports training, military, CrossFit, those would all be really good avenues to kind of learn that discipline and grit that you've learned today? Any God, of the yes. modalities? Yeah, I think any any and all of the above. And, and what I think it boils down to is like, you know, if you pick a hobby that requires daily practice in order for you to be good at it, then that that is a, a, a hobby worth pursuing, right? Yeah, dedication. In, for in sure. addition to that, that hobby has a service-oriented aspect of it, even better, even better. You know what I mean? Um, because I, I think, you know, there's a lot of things that you can be good at that don't necessarily take practice, but if you have something that, that takes attention to detail and hard work over a long period of time in order, in order to excel at, that's a worthwhile endeavor in my opinion. I heard a statistic the other day that was fascinating to me, you know, because everybody, we live in this crazy day of social media and everybody's the expert and they're posting their best moments. And we're, all we do is read headlines and we make assumptions. Um, and, and, you know, it almost paralyzes individuals to start do something because they're like, just like you said earlier, like, I can't do that. I can't do 50 Ironman. So I'm not even going to start where yeah. like just going in the door and changing from the, your pants belt to the white belt is progress. And the statistic that I heard the other day that, that was kind of like, fascinating to me is if you do something one thing 18 minutes a day that ends up being 100 hours a year and it'll put you 95 in in you'll be in the five percent um, of the population of people that do that skill you're in the top five percent and i i would challenge anybody to to not be able to carve out 18 minutes a day in a new skill and the way that the individual framed it actually it was jesse itzler um, he said, look, if I just did 18 minutes of piano a day for this year, and then next year I did 18 minutes a day of jujitsu. And I did, you know, if I took, if I did, if I applied that to my 12 year old son, dude, he, he'd be a ninja by the time he's yeah. 40 with all the skill sets yeah. and everything he had by 18 minutes a day. And so, you know, you, you said something that really resonates with me and something I say all the time is it's, it's the, the secret of success. And it's doing a lot of little things consistently over a long period of time. Well, just pick one thing and do it consistently for 18 minutes a day, and you will be in the top 5% of all people in that skill set. And so I just think we we take, we take tend to overcomplicate things, and we get overwhelmed by the enormity of being an expert or being the professional or being it. When if you break it down to its simplest forms, it's like, okay, I just need to find 18 minutes today, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to show up, and I'm going to start to refine this craft, and that alone will put you in the top 5% of the in of all people, I mean, that's mind blowing to me. You, you know where I've been trying to apply that lately, like most recently, the, the where I've like really been diligent. Cause like, I think with athletics, that's where I feel comfortable. It's how, you know, it's how I express myself, you know, in a lot of different ways. It's how I express myself physically. I, I think there's a lot of emotional expression there. It's how I build pride and respect in myself. And I think in a lot of ways, I try and garner that same pride and respect for my peers and people that are close to me through athletic performance like hey look at this thing that i comp you know it's like it's a weird benchmark for me 
But another area where I've kind of applied that same, like not like necessarily 18 minutes a day, but I was like, I need to be deliberate about this every single day if I want to be good at it, is being a dad. It's being oh, a dad. nice call, man. Yeah, it's like, yeah, I was like, sure. yo, I was like, I need to actually sit here and be with this kid for like 30 to 45 minutes. I mean, like, it doesn't take much. It does not take much. And like, I look at, at a, you know, per, I think moms do a great job of this. I think moms do a great job of being deliberate. And uh, I could go on and on about like how the patriarchy, the patriarchy is alive and well in the United States, but not as it pertains to parenting. Like mom reigns king in the United States in terms of, of like when, whoever we're like, who is the parent? It's like, you know, nobody, if you go to a parent teacher conference, mom and dad show up and they've got some paperwork, they are not going to hand it to dad. They're handing that to mom. Like, an yeah. or something. you know what I mean? Like they, we lean on mothers to spend this formative time with young kids and um and i've i've got a blended household right like me and mom co-parents my son has a stepmother who's super involved um thank you god by the way she's like you know she's my anchor uh but uh but you know I, I, there's been a couple different times where i've been like am i a good dad like you know because there's no there's no grade there's nobody telling me if i'm doing well or not well or anything like that and i just applied that that same technique i was just like you know what ben you just like I got to sit down with them for at least 45 minutes a day and just like put together Legos with them, you know, work on, you know, speech or color with them, whatever I can do. It's just like, I got to get in that time every single day. If I want to pass through the barrier to entry, that is being a good dad, you just have to like put in the work, you know? You know, it's, it's interesting. I, and I know there's some of you out there that are listening to our podcast that are, are single parents. And uh, I went through a divorce and it was, it was hard for me the week I didn't have my kids. Yeah. And I realized, you know what, here's an opportunity for me to step up and be a better dad. So the weeks I don't have my kids, I literally have a date with one kid. So like tomorrow night is actually a date with my daughter. I'll go pick my daughter up or I'll take her out. And it's just the two of us. I shut my phone off and I spend time just with her. So even though it was a crappy situation, like I don't have them for that week, I realized exactly what you said, Ben. It's a chance for me to be a better dad. Like I'm going to yeah. take this opportunity and focus and have one-on-one -on -one time. And then, you know, next week that they're with their mom, I'll pick up the other one. And then the next week I'll pick up the other one. I just rotate through that cycle. And I would challenge everybody that's in that situation. Like Ben said, like there's always a way to just be a little bit better. Like just yeah. make an offer, make every op obstacle into an opportunity. I was going to say, make no bones about it too. It's like, it's not always easy to spend just 45 minutes with a four-year-old, you know, that can be a, <laughs> yeah, it can a be frustrating rough. time. Like, you know, I'm like, there are times where I'm like pulling my hair out towards the end. And there's other times where it's fantastic. So it, it takes real work. And I think, like I said, any worthwhile pursuit just like takes a little bit of hard work. That's it. Well, this is one of my favorite things about you. I want to share a story and you can hang, hang on. I might be telling this story wrong. Hang on. Go. You tell the story in a second. I want to chime in real quick. Um, we've had some great guests and they've said a lot of amazing things. That's probably the one thing that I appreciate most that you just said about being intentional about being a parent. Um, I don't, I, I say this from stage. I don't want to be known for the 50, the hundred. I want to be known as a hero in my home. And, yeah. and all the time um, we get compliments about our kids. And I, I'm always like, damn it, that's my wife's fault. You know? <laughs> and I'm like, I gotta be better, you know, because everything, all these compliments, I'm like, yeah, my wife took care of it. Oh yeah, my wife did that. And it was interesting. She was just on a, she just went to a, 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 a city council meeting. Um, and it was about how to better the community. The number one, issue right now is absent-minded parents yeah, that yeah. don't care their their kids will go to do graffiti and the and the parents will be like now nah, so what or their kid will get into a fight and they're like did you win you know and it's so it's this problem of these lackadaisical parents that are just not involved and it absolutely takes effort and if there if i can just salute my wife sunny for two seconds she has done an unbelievable job and it's always been her dream to be a mother and i work as hard as i can to give her that gift and man i can see it in my kids and and now as my kids grow i've got four teenage girls and two adults and just looking at their peers and contrasting i'm i'm so grateful my wife took that same approach that intentionality that yeah. you're talking about and it is not easy no um, parenting is not easy and it's super easy just to to ignore them and take the, the path, but you can definitely see households where mom and dad is engaged and part of their lives. And, and man, it's just, it's just this ripple effect. So thank you for bringing that to the forefront of this conversation about being a dad, because I, do think, I think being a dad is, is, you know, we're, we're known as providers and the women are more nurturing, 
but man, these kids need dads in their lives. And so if you don't have kids, be that uncle, be that mentor, be that leader, be the man in these kids' lives because they need it. They need it. They need it. They need it. hundred percent. hundred percent. I want to share a story about Ben and Ben, I may murder this story. So you can, you can correct this for me. Yeah, no worries. Come on, tell me. <laughs> so this is one of my favorite things about you as an individual is you never shy away from hard things. Like he's almost as like you seek him out. You look for those hard things. So one of our mutual friends, Casey was telling me a story. So Casey went through the Q course with Ben. What's Q oh, course? Yeah. Uh, so the Q course is a, a part of becoming a, a Green Beret. Okay. Yep. And, and this is one of my favorite stories. I laughed about it for weeks. So during the Q course, there's, there's, they do a ton of stuff, right? You're all over the place doing things. And part of it, they're, they're doing some rucks. And so you get to a location and then they give you kind of a, an un, almost unachievable objective. And so they say, okay, you need to go this direction. It's, you got to go three kilometers and you got to do it in 11 minutes. And so, you know, you're not going to be able to make it. And so Casey was telling me the story. He's like, I'm beat up and I'm tired. And he goes, we're sitting there. We get to the next orientation point. They tell him what they got to do. And Ben screams out, unrealistic time frame. Okay. And he said, the instructors yeah. just lost it. You, and, and Casey's mind, he's like, we're going to have to do twice as much now. Yeah, you definitely butchered that story. You butchered that story. <laughs> That's okay. I'm going to get you sorted out. I'm going to get you sorted out. Yeah, so uh, tell me that story. Okay, so yeah, first off, yeah, so in the, so when you go to selection, you go through special forces assessment selection. At the time, it was like 24, 27 days. I'll say 27 because that sounds harder. That sounds harder and longer. <laughs> I'm good there. On the record, 27 days. More like 30. It was, it was super long. Longer than whatever anybody is doing now. Longer and harder now. <laughs> um, but uh, <laughs> whatever, right? So, but it was pretty miserable and you get through selection and you're like that was so difficult right and a lot of guys don't even make it on the first try but you get through selection and selection you get selected and you don't know it at the time but you're just getting selected to go to an even harder course like there were uh, parts of the special forces qualification course which is usually a minimum of a year if you're an 18 delta or have different specialties or difficult languages like if you specialize in medicine which is our 18 deltas the medics um, which saying like take your appendix out in the woods um, or if you have a difficult language like Persian Farsi or Mandarin or something crazy like that I mean you could be there for two years um, I got lucky at an easy language and uh, an okay um, military occupational skill I was an 18 echo or a uh, combo guy um, so I was only there for about a year but there's difficult difficult portions um, that are made to be intentionally miserable, but also they're teaching you a lot of things. And there's one portion called small unit tactics. And small unit tactics, I, in my opinion, was more difficult than selection. And at the time was about five or six weeks. And you just spend essentially a couple days um, living in tents. And, you know, you have a planning bay. that's just another tent, a bunch of crappy tables and chairs. And essentially you'll, you'll plan missions. And then you go out and then in the, you're in the field for five to six days at a time executing on those missions right raids ambushes sometimes just patrolling sometimes special reconnaissance you know goofy stuff like this all the different things that are going to be requisite for somebody that's participating um in like these normative military actions for for special operations units like green berets rangers navy seals you know they're all special operations they all have different specialties but all of them are required to you know have baseline ability to perform reconnaissance and direct action right and that school is kind of teaching you that, which is great because I didn't have a combat arms background. I had spent some time in a scout platoon, but I did not have a combat arms MOS. I started out as a radio guy. Like people would just come up to me like, my is broken. What do I do? And I was like, ah, you idiot. You just need to like probably change the batteries or see if your antenna is connected. And literally 90% of the time, that's what was going on. But, you know, so I didn't have like a, a huge tactical background. So small unit tactics was like literally a place where I was like, learning how to be a combat arms individual like learning the craft um and they the instructors during that time had all been to combat and everybody that was graduating the q course at that time 2004 2005 we're all going to go on to combat so they were unkind to us because one they had been battle hardened over the last several years at the onset of the global war on terror and knew to an absolute certainty that we were all going to be participating in combat as yeah. special operations soldiers so they had high expectations so i mean they would thrash us you know they'd wake us up in the middle of the night you know we'd go a couple of days at a time without sleeping they'd starve us 
Um, super run of the mill stuff though. So this is nothing uncommon. They're still doing it to people today. You go over there to Ranger School over a four pinning, and everybody's getting a huge dose of that right now. But <laughs> you know, but they would always we would be in formation and in the special forces, there comes a certain point in time where they realize after having made it through selection or or getting along down the road a certain amount of time, you've displayed requisite discipline. Like they know, like you're not making it through selection without having personal discipline of some variety. You know what I mean? You take care of your feet, you keep your shit packed, you're keeping track of your equipment. So, you know, there's a little bit of, I don't want to say camaraderie or lack of discipline, but like I was able to speak more comfortably occasionally with instructors and this kind of stuff <laughs> than like, than somebody might at a, at a regular army school. But every now and again, they would tell it, they're like, you guys, you got two minutes to go to your rucksacks and get X, Y, Z and be right back here. And I would scream out. I'd be like, that's an unrealistic time frame." And usually <laughs> my instructors at the time were kind of used to that. So they were fine with it. They thought that was okay. Casey and I had just gotten done with small unit tactics, arguably what is the hardest portion of the special forces qualification course. And we were cleaning our weapons. And anybody that's ever had weapons turn in, you've had this weapon, you've been carrying around with you for five or six weeks, all messed up. And the guy that is taking the, the weapons, the guy that runs the arms room, wants to look at each one with like absolute maniacal detail. If it's even got a speck of dirt on it, they're going to kick it back. So you spend hours in this weapon cleaning room, all this stuff. And then finally, this guy come to find out, he's like, hey, I got to get home at five o'clock. Wife is waiting on me. I don't care what shape these weapons are in. You need to get them all put back together and get them everybody in line to turn in there right now. I'm going to take all the weapons in like 10 minutes. So these instructors, who was partly our instructors, but there was another group of instructors from an incoming class. By the way, in that incoming class, Casey and me were in the outgoing class. We're done. You know what I'm saying? But in the incoming class was a good friend of ours, Sean Simmons. And by the way, none other than Jason V, v uh, B. A. Van Camp, right? <laughs> who were incoming. And we're mixed, these new guys and old guys, old instructors, new instructors. And they come in here and they go, you guys got two minutes to get all these weapons put back together and get up in line out there in front of the arms room so we turn the shit in. And I scream out, I go, that's an unrealistic time frame. The and incoming instructors <laughs> lost their mind. We're like not, like not uh, enjoying how I was talking to them, you know what I mean? And proceeded to just smoke out of everybody in the room. They're like, get in the front lead and rest. Everybody get down and just started trashing everybody. But what was interesting is they were like, not you guys that are turning in your weapons, though. You guys go go line up out there and shut the fuck up. But there are all these other guys who had just got there. They're, you know, it's like when you're you're like when you're standing next to a guy, like I was a dude, I was just standing here, like oh, we don't care, and just started destroying those guys. And they like destroyed them for like a period of hours. Um, in, that, in this like weapons cleaning bay, by like me and Casey were like smoking cigarettes, turning in our rifles and stuff. But it was like an ongoing joke. I would always. They would be like, you got two minutes. I was like, you know that, you know, that's not a real, nobody's doing that in two minutes. Why are you even saying that? You know, like serious guys, but sometimes guys, sometimes instructors would think it was funny. Other times they would think it was not so funny and, you know, varying degrees of punishment. You know, I might just have to do a couple of pushups or they might make me pick up a telephone pole, go carry it down to this helicopter that they got to the entrance of Camp McCall and then carry it back. Not an exaggeration. Have had that had that happen to me before. You know what I mean. So, <laughs> what, just, what's, <laughs> what's the worst punishment you've ever had in, in military? In the military, damn. I real okay. I did. Like, the most I grueling, that. gritty thing you've had. Was there say. something that like pushed you? That you're just like, like, oh, like you were like, yeah. This, there was there was I, something almost broke me. I almost got broke in the military. So they almost broke me. They almost like they almost won. They almost yeah. won. So I was in the. This was when I was in the conventional army. And as a matter of fact, these are one of the moments where I knew I was going to join the special forces. You know what I mean? Like I knew it. I knew it was going to happen. And I, so we were in Baghdad, Iraq. We had only been there a couple months, not very long. The initial invasion was for the most part over. So there had been a lull in general violence. Like when we got into the initial invasion, it was bananas. Third ID was there. You know, you had these Bradleys rolling over vehicles. People were getting zipped up by 30 millimeter guns. And every now and again, you would, I mean, most people got the memo. Most of them just gave up as soon as we rolled in. But every now and again, you'd like run into a, like a pocket of guys in the special Republican guard who just like hadn't got the memo or just like. <laughs> yeah, they just didn't realize. Yeah, like, like 10 dudes sitting in a foxhole 
next thing you know there's like 60 people shooting at him right like not a fair fight which is great i'm not over in war trying to have fair fights i'm not trying yeah. to to go one-on-one -on -one with mike tyson i want to destroy you you know what i'm saying <laughs> yeah. war it's not meant to be fair if i can get around it right um but uh most of the fighting had died down later on months months later the fighting would pick up in a way that was very unexpected and very difficult for all of us it would stay difficult for a while um but at the time it was kind of peaceful and you know my days were spent either escorting people that wanted to drive around town to like go get updates from a tactical operations command down the street picking up mail for people picking up chow this kind of stuff but when i wasn't doing that i was like on guard duty i was like a, an enlisted guy like a, a a specialist which is like one bump above a private first class so you know not high up on the pecking order and i was reading uh like a book i think a tom clancy book um I, like I think it was without remorse, the one that Michael B. Jordan was just in, and they yeah, read it. <laughs> yeah, great book, by the way. <laughs> yeah, uh, but and I was reading it, and I had my my helmet off. I had my helmet off, and I was up on an OP, an observation point. And they had them littered throughout the compound where we had we had kind of taken over. And my first sergeant caught me. He was making his rounds, came up, saw that my K pod was off, and for the next like three weeks um sentenced me to like essentially hard labor so when I wasn't on guard from sunrise to sunset I had to fill up sandbags carry them up to that position to build parapets and it come to find out it, it equated to thousands of sandbags oh. and I never I didn't end up finishing it at some point somebody caught wind like a commander caught wind of what was happening and they were like that's crazy and I mean I was working so hard that like my I my I actually like destroyed my own clothing like you know my like my clothes started coming apart like I had like blisters all over all my fingers and this went on for weeks for weeks and I said nothing to anybody I just spent every day just like carrying like 50 pound sandbags up and down three flights of stairs this abandoned bombed out building to the top of this guard position building parapets like my friends just watching me like in disbelief but like, it was weird because when it was happening, you know, and I remember this guy, his name's First Sergeant Key. And I think he was like an assistant principal at, at like a high school or something. And you know what? I remember he would check on me and he'd be like, how are things going, uh, Bun? And I was like, great, First Sergeant. Fantastic. I was like, nobody's going to stop me from doing anything, you know? And at night I would like, I would weight lift and I would run, I would do sprint repeats up and down the three flights of stairs so I could get in better shape. Because remember when I told you that I only got like like 17 push-ups or like 26 sit-ups I yeah. could barely run a, a mile in nine minutes yeah those days were long gone by the time I was I was in the big war and I I was training because I knew I was going to be in the special forces I hadn't gone to selection yet I hadn't even put my name in the hat for the school but I knew I was going to be a, a green beret I knew it deep down in my bones and like if I could go back in time and think for Sergeant Key I'd like I'd like can you remember that one time you made me like unrealistically try and build like a 10,000 stand bag <laughs> parapets on a guard station i really want to say thanks even though that was like draconian out of control i became a green beret because of that so thanks thanks for helping me cut my teeth you know, what I mean? <laughs> you know like, it's, so, it's so funny ben that you say that like we look back at the times in our life that feel like it's gonna kill us yeah like you just said dude it made you like you're arguably one of the strongest mental like physically obviously but mental as well that i've ever met like i'm honored to be around you and, and that's that contributed to it and that's and it doesn't mean that everybody has to go do that like we all go through hard yeah and it's just a matter of like what you just said like just resonates and i hope everybody's listening to this like you knew who you were going to become and you weren't yeah. letting anything stop you from becoming that and i'm telling you and and you you asked it and i had never really thought about it that much like what is the hardest or worst thing friends of mine have been killed i've been in bad firefights i've you know i've seen and done a lot of it but i'll tell you what that was just like three it was it seemed it was like nonsense like there was no reason for it and a lot of happens like that in the military you're just like weirdly nonsensically being punished for a prolonged amount of time and it's like draconian and outrageous but honestly like looking back on it it was like it was probably one of the best times in my life and you're right like it just it made me it made me more formidable you know what i mean the bar was permanently raised and i was That's not crazy. having it you know i was I, not I, having it. I i think i think in life it's super relevant that we're dealing with that kind of nonsense and bull crap that's trying to break us down. And it's, it's just called life. Right. And yeah. we're all dealing with it. And then, and then while you're dealing with it and maintaining the courage to show up and trying to get the next belt and, 
moving on in life, like you look back and you go, man, that almost broke me. But in yeah. fact, it turned me into the person that I am today. And I'm grateful for it. And, and I do, you know, I've talked about this a lot too. I mean, I, we lost everything in the, in the 2008 economic crash. I used to own a mortgage company. And I look back in that moment when I, when I was at rock bottom and when it was the hardest and when it almost broke me, um, I'm so grateful for those times because it did it forged who I am today. And, and I just want to, I've said this before, but I want to go on record and say, I want you to recognize that you're at rock bottom. I want to congratulate you for being at rock bottom. And if you choose to continue to show up on, on your path and change your circumstances, because we all have that opportunity in life, you will eventually look back, be grateful for that moment because it's going to help you become who you are today. That's going to turn you into an invincible person in this world because we, we all need that. And so I, I love that sentiment that what almost breaks us turns us into who we become and becomes one of the greatest experiences we've ever had. Yeah. And I, and what the greatest part about being at rock bottom, there is nowhere to go, but up. Nowhere yeah, to go but up. Yeah. if you are at rock bottom, you're like, fantastic. Like <laughs> everything from here on out gets better. You know what I mean? Have you ever seen, I don't know. I just yeah. did come into my mind. Have you seen Yuri Boyka, like the undisputed series? Yeah. yeah I'm yeah. just picturing that in my mind. There's that one scene where him and the, I think it was a, I think it was a green beret like they're stuck in this prison and they're just they're having to do all this hard labor and they like turn it into their workout routine so yeah, they're like yeah. doing squats with the rocks like i'm just picturing you with like the the eye of the tiger pounding in the background doing this this parapet of just thousands of sandbags like that's amazing yeah, I, I remember my friends would see me doing it and they would shake their head like they were in disbelief that it was happening to me and like it, there would be t and at the time you know guiltily i was i smoked cigarettes at the time and I would just be like walking by smoking a cigarette with a barrel, a big old wheelbarrow, like full of <laughs> bags, like using an e-tool. I didn't even have a shovel. God, it was terrible, terrible, <laughs> terrible time in my life. And I was like in a war zone. Like it was just like, I was like, dude. And I think the only reason it got better, or I think the only reason is they ended up hiring a bunch of kids from the economy to like clean and like help clean out some of the trashes. We like bombed that place. Like it was like the old officer's club. Um, and like they were like paid them to like clean out trash and, and fill sandbags. So like they're like, you know, Bun, you've been doing this for like three weeks. We got these guys that are like doing this now. I'm like, I guess you're good to you you don't have to do this anymore. And I'm like smoking a cigarette, like the fingers on my gloves cut off. I'm like, wait, for real? Because <laughs> like the way it was going, I was gonna be like, I was gonna be at it for the whole deployment. I was there for a year. It was, it's pretty <laughs> funny first song of king man if you're listening dude shouts out homie i really appreciate that <laughs> well my friend we sure appreciate you honestly ultimate respect anything like wait, this wait i want i want to hear him tell quickly the story that where you broke oh you... i ruptured my ucl i ruptured my... yeah 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 yeah, yeah that's right. so that's i i had dabbled in like jujitsu and combat sports like way back in the day like basically when i was at fort bragg so when i was at fort bragg and i was training to be a green beret like I built up a lot of my personality around becoming a personal soldier. And a lot of times, I'm going to tell you something. A lot of times in combat, you'll be made to feel like a coward, regardless if you did something brave or not. You understand what I'm saying? It's like it's like when you race, it's like when you race Ironmans, you're already at the absolute 1%. You'll still find a way to feel inadequate. It doesn't even matter if you win. You will still feel like a loser. You will There's still feel like a loser. I, I know you know what I'm talking about. So, you know, I had spent this time in combat and I had been made to feel like a coward. I had been made to feel less than, and I was determined to turn that around. I like didn't want to feel that way inside. And that was a big reason why I wanted to become a Green Beret is I was like, I will show everybody I'm not a coward. I will show my mom. I will show the world that I can do better. And I dabbled in combat sports because I thought it was like a big part of the warrior ethos. Like, this is part of the path. I must... I must learn to fight. I must learn to shoot. I must run fast. I must lift heavy. This is what is required. I used to read Miyamoto Musashi's Book of Five Rings. I kept a copy of it, like in my bag. I was so serious about it. Um, well, real but quick, I, I think I think every young person. I mean, it's impossible, but I think every every young person should be should be required to do some type of combat sports. And I believe oh. it, it's forged who I am today. I, I wrestled for seven years at a high level. And, and, and I believe that was the foundational pieces to my mental toughness and grit that I, that I continue to develop over years. And so I, I love where you're going with this. Guaranteed, right? Guaranteed. And um, 
you know, but dabbled in combat sports, but got really into CrossFit. And then of course that panned out because I opened up a CrossFit gym. I cut my teeth in entrepreneurship in that way. I'm very well known in the community. Um, for the most part, kind of, uh, it's weird. It sounds like I'm tooting my own horn, but, uh, but it worked out that I got into CrossFit and fell out of combat sports. Fast forward to about a year ago, I get back into jujitsu. I got back into it because of a good friend of mine. My best friend was doing it. And I just got sick and tired of hearing somebody that I love and respect doing something that I wasn't enjoying with him. You ever had that? You ever had your buddy start telling you about some hobby? And you're like, you know what, dude? Like, I'm going to get into He's into fly fishing, too, but I'm, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. <laughs> yeah, dude, I'm not going to spend the next 20 years trying to catch a tarpon on a fly line. You know what I mean? It's not happening, <laughs> you know? But he, he was into jujitsu, and I, I took it up. I got into it. And like less than three months in, um, a, a former D1A wrestler, this kid named Austin, um, you know, it was like 340 pounds. I'm rolling with him, puts me in an Americana successfully, rolls over onto it, snaps my arm, breaks, dislocates my elbow. My UCL completely ruptures, right? Jeez. I got to get a surgery. I got to get a UCL reconstruction, Tommy John surgery. Very common. Surgery goes poorly my ulnar nerve becomes compressed and I get disuse atrophy in a portion of my hand and palsy still can't completely feel my pinky or ring finger lost a ton of gross mobility, this kind of stuff. While I was trying to recover from that, come to find out I have to have two additional corrective surgeries, one to decompress the nerve and then place it on the inside of my arm. So it has a better environment to heal in. And then another one where they take my medial nerve and junction it on to my ulnar nerve to try and like supercharge it. So now not only am I like trying to heal back from this, but also on top of that, um, my brain is having to like relearn what nerve does what because they're hijacking one of the nerves to try and help the one that has palsy. So I have for sure like permanent damage in my left hand. I'm never going to get all of it back. Um, and I had my last surgery about three months ago, which left me with about a, an 18 inch jagged scar that goes from my tattoo all the way up to the middle of my hand. Um, each surgery was immensely painful, um, decreased my ability to do CrossFit and physical pursuits. But but here's here's the deal, friend. I kept training the entire time. Every time I got hurt 48 hours later, I was on an assault bike or walking for 45 minutes a day until the doctor said that I could start using my right arm. And then I would do workouts one armed. And then about three months ago, after after I'd had about six to eight weeks after my last surgery, and I was cleared to start using both my hands again. I started jujitsu again, and I just signed up for a local competition. Uh, so this is this is a sport that I had gotten back into after a decade off. Three months in, was terribly, terribly injured. Right, painful, painful surgeries, um, permanently injured my left hand. I know what's at stake here. I know, I know what can be, what can happen in a combat sport. Right, you can break your neck. You can be choked unconscious. You can have your arm broken. But like, here's the deal, man. Hard, hard chargers get charged hard. As a matter of fact, after that first surgery, when I knew that things were going wrong and I knew that I was going to have to have follow on corrective surgeries inside, I knew to a certainty I was never going to stop ju doing jujitsu. No. I was like, it's just a matter. Of, it's a matter of months before I'm able to get back on the mats and I will never step off of them again. Nothing will stop me from doing this sport. And a big part of it is because I was injured terribly doing it. I, I was, I encountered what was an immense setback. And then I think in some cases what I had a lot of people quit the sport completely. Like I'm not stopping. It's not going to yeah, stop. I, I got to share one quick story because yeah. it's been so well. I uh, like, like I, this is what I love about you, man. Like where someone else would use this as an excuse. Okay. Now I got a reason to quit. It's turned you the opposite way. You're like, no hard things. Don't stop me. I was out actually the jujitsu event in uh, Alabama a couple of weeks ago. There's a guy out there, shout out to him. His, his UFC name was Zombie Mike. Um, yeah. Amazing man. Absolutely love him to death. I've got to be pretty good friends with him. And at the event, I was I was right on the edge of the mat where he was rolling with another guy. And the guy he was rolling with was was honestly not any good. And Mike was really just kind of having fun with him. Yeah. At one point, he's got this guy just completely wrapped up and he's pulling his, like he's sitting on his back and he's pulling his head backwards, just kind of screwing around with him. Yeah, and the yeah. guy kind of starts grunting and groaning and Mike goes, I don't understand what you're saying. He goes, I don't speak bitch. And I <laughs> laughed so hard, but it resonated with me that, man, that's life. Like when life yeah. hits you, you got to look back at life and say, look, I don't know what you're saying. I don't speak bitch. Like I'm, I'm stepping up. I'm, I'm going to be Ben Bun. I'm going to be coach bunny. 
Like I'm going to be better because of this experience. Like I do yeah. huge respect and, to you. Bro. And I tell people all the time, like, I think there there's magic in doing these things that are really hard. And like, and I tell people all the time, people think I'm irregular because I, I, I gravitate towards hard things or try hard things, man, honestly, I've failed at quite a few of them. And then for every hard thing, there's been plenty of things that I tried and I fell off and maybe it never picked them back up. But listen, if you, if you try 10 hard things, but you do stick to one and then, you know, you become a champion in the sport of Ironmans or a black belt in jujitsu or a green beret or an Olympian, it doesn't matter if you quit those other nine things, as long as you just stuck to the one, just keep trying and let, let, you know, get that one sticky thing and just stick to it. And develop that grit and that tenacity and give it that 18 minutes a day. And if that's all it takes well, to become a pro, I mean, hey, you're, you're better off than 99% of the population. I think there, there's something magical about that. Well, and, and if you're if you're truly showing up and you're trying hard things, you're you're going to stumble. You're going to fall. You're going to break your arm. You're going to you're going to yeah, have yeah. some missteps. But what I loved and what I'm going to pull from that story and, and we'll end there with this beautiful lesson Um is that you you never look for an opportunity or an option to to quit. And a lot of people, something like that happens and they're like, oh, sweet, I don't have to do that hard thing anymore. And you were like, no, I, that, I'm not using this as an excuse. I can do different things, continue to grow, continue to push, continue to get stronger as this part heals. Eventually this will get better. And then I'm not going to be, ba- I'm not, I'm not going to have taken steps backwards. I'm still progressing forward. Yeah. not looking for excuses, not finding that reason to quit. And that is a, a unique mindset and one that I that I truly believe we can all develop. And so congrats on, on having that mindset. You are in a, a 1% uh, area of this world um, because you look around, a lot of people are just seeking reasons to quit and, and validating their desire to be soft. So thank you for being one hard SOB. And uh, <laughs> I appreciate it. I I've re- I've really enjoyed this conversation and too, uh, everybody gained a lot from this, this man and his experiences. Um, congrats on your success with the CrossFit gym. Thank you for serving our country. We need people like you. If you're struggling on your journey right now, go seek out combat sports, go seek out CrossFit, go to a gym, just cross that threshold, go and start. One of the hardest things to do is to get up to have the courage to start. Stop comparing yourself against everybody else. Compare yourself against who you are, where you are right now, and try to be better every single day. So, man, thank you. I appreciate your time. Absolutely, Ben. You're you're a stud, brother. Excited to see you this weekend. Uh, I know. I can't wait, man. It's going to be a good time. It'll be a blast. Thanks, brother. We should appreciate you. All right, gents. Yeah.